I'm uh, Andre Kalbenhais and I am an e-research specialist here at Victoria University up at ITS. My name is Chris Nenon and I'm a PhD candidate at the School of Psychology here. When we, we, we were doing a particular perspe perspective taking um, experiment and at the end we, we wanted to sort of increase the immersion, increase the urgency and see if people operated in the same way so we were thinking well how can we make it more immersive than this real life version and how could we make it more urgent and so one idea that I had was virtual reality but it seemed very science fiction at the time to test people in a psychology experiment in a simulation that seemed like something that was still so far down the road and then I was going down to just get a coffee and then I saw you guys setting up your demonstration for uh, Vic Open Day and then I mean you guys showed me how how it's not actually far down the road, uh, the, the idea of creating these simulations. Um, it's actually quite uh, available. The simulations were created, and the reason we'd create them in, in a simulation as opposed to in real life is because it would otherwise not be ethically permissible sometimes. So, for, you know, for instance, like, um, I wanted to create some sort of sense of urgency in the, in the current paradigm that I was doing in real life, but I would never be able to do um, I would never be able to like set the room on fire, you know, obviously, because it's not ethically permissible, but I can give, I could possibly give people the, the experience of, of seeing that happen in VR and maybe, you know, that, that would be okay. I mean, certain things you still can't sort of trick people into thinking you're happy just because... It's just wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Like, so we're, you know, we're in Wellington, so obviously I wouldn't want to have like some sort of earthquake uh, happening, you know, because that would trigger some, some really awful reactions I'm sure but um, you know there are certain areas where we can um, explore uh, human responses um, that would otherwise be just ethically out of out of bounds um, but it offers very minimal, minimal risk in a, in a simulation. We had one of our members in our team actually was sitting there watching us set up this thing he just wanted to play a game you know he didn't really want to what the thing we had was this tilt brush like painting in three-dimensional space he just wasn't interested in the tilt brush thing. It's like, we want, I want to play a game, I don't, I don't really want to have a go at this painting thing. It looks, it's not very engaging. But as soon as he put the VR headset on, he was just like, wow! And he was just, he just so engaged and just sort of sitting there just painting with the light and like getting down on the ground and painting spirals. And you know, he just, it's, it's, it's such a different experience than what it looks like mm -hmm. in, a, in a virtual reality setup. It kind of is, right? Like it is this sort of really, that first time especially, it's just kind of, sometimes almost overwhelmingly engaging. I don't know quite, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that, that for me that's definitely been some of the, the kind of cases where yeah, people haven't been that interested in looking at the, the 2D thing hasn't really grabbed them, but once they get in it there. Yeah, I've, I've noticed a similar thing um, because like, as I've been looking at other um, VR headsets and just seeing like what they can do, I'll, they'll often have commercials associated with them and I'll watch it and it's just sort of funny to, uh, when VR companies try and show the content of VR in a 2D commercial because it just doesn't cap you don't get an idea about what's so great about that because in any sort of like you know first person shooter or whatever uh, you know you can look around and it, on a screen it'll look the same so you can't show it's that aspect of like presence that's not yep. that doesn't translate across and so like when you put the headset on and then you have that sort of feedback from your from your muscles going okay I'm turning my head and I'm getting that 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 set the environment moves with me that's that creates this sort of illusion of, of presence, of being in the space that is really what we're trying to get at in, in, my, in my experiment as well, is to create that. My favorite example of that is in the, in the tilt brush scene where you've got like a pedestal and you get someone in there and they're like, I'm gonna paint a pot plant with a flower. <laughs> And then they kind of turn around the corner and their pot plant is two-dimensional, yeah. floating a foot away from the front of the pedestal. You know, like from the angle they were in, it looks fine. Mm. But like the moment they rotate it, and it's they kind of like, oh, I have to really think about this differently, like how I would do this. And yeah. I think it's, it's a nice... I had a similar, I had a friend who went to the tilt brush to sort of to play with the VR thing because everyone in the hallway wanted to sort of come in and have a, have a run with it. Um, and so I explained to them, like, one of the things in tilt brush you can do is you can paint something and you can use the grip buttons to scale it out. And so I said, so you could paint something small and scale it out, and then it will, you'll suddenly be standing in it. And she goes, oh, cool, I'll paint a house. But she painted a 2D house, and then she scaled it out, and it was just a big wall. And I was like, well, yeah, it's because you haven't thought about the, the third dimension of it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I think the good example is one of the demos we have is you kind of standing on the edge of this cliff. And I certainly found the first time I used it to be, uh, I, I hate heights, like, and I, I found it really uncomfortable. Um, it wasn't too bad, but you could definitely feel it, a certain unease 
it was kind of definitely there. Mm. And now when I turn it on, I happily walk over the edge. You know, like you know it's you know it's not. But I do wonder, like as you're saying, Chris, like you know if I had been distracted, you know, like if I was focusing, like if I wasn't aware that I backed up to the edge of a cliff mm. and I was looking at a butterfly or something, I don't know, you know, and then you suddenly glance at, whoa, like that's the edge. I mean, that might be a, yeah. a different thing, like when you kind of stop being mindful of it being VR, I guess. Yeah. As soon as I, someone told me that they were afraid of heights, I said, you got to try this <laughs> um, because I just loved how I would do something where like, I'd put them at that cliff and I would just yell at them that they were in a room that has a carpet. Remember, you are in a room that has a carpet. You're not at the edge of this cliff. I'm, well, not yelling at them, but I just keep reminding them that over and over again. And I would say, come on, take that step, step over it. And they just could not yeah. do it. Well, they, I mean, they would do it eventually, but like they hand back the controllers and be like covered in sweat, you know, and like you could just tell they're harder than racing. I mean, it was, it's like no amount of conscious control could stop them from feeling that, that fear of of what it looks like. And so that's what I think is like the most interesting thing. But for like the rest of the staff, it was really a good morale booster to sort of have a place where they could go and um, you know, experience this thing that's completely new to them. The body's just not really, or the mind is just not really programmed yet to be immediately desensitized to the fact that what you see is not what is actually there. I think it's possible that like down the road as VR becomes more and more something that most people have had an experience with. We're probably gonna like see that people get desensitized to it. Like um, the first movie that was ever made um, was of a, like a train coming towards the, the the camera, but along the side of it, and they showed it at a cinema, and people had never seen like film like that, and it sent the entire crowd like running for the doors, literally like in panic. So like, you know, that's and you know we don't get that same effect at all now. So you'd imagine that VR might have a similar trajectory in the sense that right now it's. It's very immersive because we don't have a lot of experience with it as a, as a you know, as, a, as humans. But maybe down the road we'll, that that'll sort of fade. But that just adds to why it's very it's very useful to study psychology in VR at this moment because we get these naturalistic responses that we might not be able to replicate before years. people get too used to it. Yeah, exactly. Before they're aware. I don't know. I, I don't know how. I don't know if that's something that will develop in people, but it could. You know, the way that film sort of has. The current generation of big VR kind of basically came out of like basically garage developers being like, I'm really frustrated with the fact that VR sucks and I want VR to be awesome and it seems like it should be able to be awesome. Mm. And I don't think this is tied to military development at all. Mm. I think the military had things in a way a lot like what our current VR systems are, but I think they were developed in complete isolation. I mean, I, I guess I thought about it in the context of like them allowing the astronauts that will be going to Mars or something like that to sort of simulate what that might be like using VR as well as a number of other uh, simulatory experiences. But um, yeah, I've always gotten the impression that it's something that's kind of developed, I mean if it has developed in the military earlier, mm -hmm. that that's been really quite separate to sort of what's been developed creatively. I mean I think the, I think the current, I mean there's some uses for it now in terms of like the vaguely military related things where I think there's some work on post-traumatic stress disorder where they use VR oh, yeah. to kind of put people quicker. back into the old situations and kind of resolve them in different ways. I don't know about using it as a, a research tool particularly, but I think for teaching and learning it could be incredible. Um, you know, quite often you have a piece of kit that you would love your undergraduate students to use. So I think there's a case there where you could be um, doing experiments where they, in VR they could use like a mass spectrometer or they could use um, you know, you could even have them tinker with, you know, a linear accelerator or something, you know, where they, you just would never let them do that, you know, yeah. um, but you could kind of give them that experience um, in the lab or experiments that are dangerous, right? Like you can, we used to do a lab in physics where we'd irradiate uh, copper disks with americium source um, and that was you know, fine, but you know, if you want to do more uh, dramatic radiation experiments, you know, like maybe there's a case to do them in VR if you want to do something really dramatic, or well, in chemistry the same sort of thing. Some experiments are not safe to actually do in front of students. I think that the VR headset could be like that next thing that every household kind of has one of, the way that like the PC became that and the laptops and the televisions and VCRs and DVD players. I mean, it's like, I think it's that next big thing that we can expect everyone could have for various uses. I think. On the one hand, um, like Skype is such a, 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 a powerful thing that brings people together right now. Um, but like my parents who are on the other side of the world, they, you know, Skype's never really enough because there's no sense of being present in the same place as that person. If they had a VR headset and I had a VR headset, 
and we were in some sort of, we could be in some sort of communal space together. You know, I, I'm sitting on a chair here, and it would look like they're sitting on the chair, and there's no separation of, of screen whatsoever. Um, and I think that would be quite an, like another level of sort of um, bringing people together. Yeah, I mean, I guess I sort of agree as well. I think, I don't know that we'll see them in every single household, but I think you'll see them in a lot. I mean, I think it'll become like, as ubiquitous as like, you know, people with a, a PlayStation or an Xbox or something, you know, like maybe not every single you know, person, but most people I think will have one or two in a house. And you know, yeah, people will use it for all sorts of purposes, not just playing games, I mean like watching films or you know, like all sorts of particular kinds of entertainment and things. There's this really, uh, he's getting quite famous, he's done a few TED Talks, uh, his name is Chris Milk and he's doing work with filming in VR and he does uh, these sort of uh, videos in these different areas that just desperately need resources really. So. Um, villages that don't have access to clean water and stuff. So he's filmed, um, I, mean, I, I saw this one video in VR where they, um, you know, they, they just filmed the experience of this one village getting access to clean water for the first time. And it was actually quite moving because it was not actors, you know, it was people that were, you know, genuinely uh, uh, so excited that they were moved to, to tears by the presence of, of um, this water and you're right there at the center of it. I, I really got the sense that I was there. I really sort of forgot that I was in this room. I mean, I think it, it's a really powerful tool in that way to sort of make you know, politicians uh, or, or just people who have control over other people's lives feel a bit of the, the emotional weight of the decisions that they make that they currently might feel, you know conveniently alienated from right now, you know? So I think in that way, it actually, it could be very powerful for building compassion.